Today under Lifestyle, we're gonna iron out some of the finer details of the one-ton axle swap on the Land Rover Discovery. This video is brought to you by Barnes Four Wheel Drive. If you're in the market for affordable suspension joints and components, make sure you check out Barnes for the best prices in the industry. And if you wanna save an additional 10%, make sure you use coupon code DIRTLIFESTYLE at checkout. In the last episode, we built a custom pitman arm and now we can button up a bunch of loose ends and set this disco down on its own weight. I keep running into these little, these little nuggets of good luck with this axle swap. And one of them is that the lower coil buckets on the disco unbolt. So I don't have to cut anything off with a torch and then re-weld it, nothing like that. All I have to do is drill some holes and mount all four lower coil buckets onto the axles. So I'm gonna take a couple minutes. I'm gonna do that right now, get all this done right out of the gate. Then we can mount some shocks. With these lower coil buckets installed, we can move on to installing these 7100 series Bilstein shocks. So why did I choose these shocks? These are a brand new version of what I took off of here. The shocks that I took off was a 7100 series shock that looked exactly like this. And I, when I was working with the guys at Bilstein, I told them what I was building. And what we decided is that it would be best to do a little bit stiffer valving on the rear shocks. So the boxes on the left are a little bit stiffer valving because we've got all that extra weight from the rooftop tent, we're gonna have a bunch of gear back there and that should help dampen the rear a little bit more than the front um, and accommodate for all that extra weight. These are external reservoirs and for me that is an absolute must because on those really long bumpy roads and bumpy trails, you wanna keep that shock nice and cool so it doesn't stiffen up and ruin your ride. Since explaining why an external reservoir shock is superior to an emulsified shock could take its own video, we're gonna table this conversation to a later date. But the short version is shock life, shock fade, and shock temperatures are all improved with an external reservoir, and those are all categories that can be improved on any vehicle. With the shocks installed and the tires on, we can finally measure for bump stops. So right now I have the front end jacked up about four inches or so, and that's really close to the amount of up travel that I want whenever we're gonna be at full compression on both sides. So we're gonna have a little bit more than that, probably close to five or five and a half inches of up travel when one side droops out and then the other side is at full stuff. So that's why we've left about an inch and a half or so of clearance up here to make sure that whenever the passenger side is dropped out, we still have enough room between our tire and our fender over here. I have had some questions about fender clearance and I'm very fortunate. I had a uh, subscriber in Seattle. Thank you, Jason. He, he set me up with a bunch of these uh, aftermarket fender flares for the disco and it should fit a 37. So we're gonna be trimming this out in order to accommodate the, the larger rubber. And uh, that's how we're gonna take care of that problem. Now what we're dealing with today is we're checking to make sure we have the right size shocks and at full compression, we still have plenty of shafts, so we're not bottoming out our shock, which is exactly what we're looking for. And now we can set a height for our bump stop. And if you look back there, you're gonna see that weird brown rubber thing. That is the factory bump stop, and that's what I plan on reusing. So I'm gonna just build a bump stop pad off of the top of the axle. It's gonna touch that. We're gonna do this on both sides, and then uh, it'll make it to where we don't bash our fenders to pieces with our tires.
This lower bump pad went together super easy, which is nice because this is something that I can't really plan for. You can plan for it if you're doing an axle swap in a JK or something popular, but when you're doing a full custom jammy like this that no one's ever done before, um, you don't really know exactly how this is gonna turn out. Luckily, I was able to get away with it just two plates. I've got a 3 8 plate on top, a quarter inch plate on the side, I tacked it all into place and the, the, the uh, bump stop strikes on the pad exactly where I need it to. So it looks like this is gonna work fine. The long-term plan is gonna be whenever I pull this axle back out here in the next week or two to do the gear sets, I'm gonna add some gusseting onto this, finish weld it, it's gonna look all pretty, it's gonna be super strong and uh, it should work great for application. Now I wanna move on to limit straps. Limit straps are super important. I see a lot of guys not running them, but and I didn't run them for a long time. Um, but you see a couple failed shocks and you will start running them. <laughs> Luckily, I've never had that problem, but I've seen some crazy videos online. I recommend you look them up where the shock will fail. The axle comes all the way down. There's no limit strap. The shock fails right here. It pulls the bottom of the shock out and then the axle just keeps going. Shears drive shaft, springs shoot out. It's just crazy. <laughs> There's some great videos out there. We don't want to be a victim of that. So we're going to use limit straps. Um, the way to do a limit strap is uh, you mount it on the chassis somewhere, you mount it on your axle somewhere, and uh, hopefully you measure everything correctly so it will protect the shock so no weight at all from the axle is transferred into the shock and the shock's not having to hold anything up. We just want the shock to dampen, we don't want it to hold anything. So what I did is I lowered the axle all the way down and then I pumped it up like an inch and a half somewhere in there and uh, now I have a hole to hole measurement because what I, my plan is to uh, drill a hole up here run a bolt through for the upper limit part of the limit strap, drill a hole down here, do the same thing for the lower part of the limit strap. So all I need to do is take a hole to hole measurement, then I'll subtract an extra inch that will then give me like two and a half inches of wiggle room or two and a half inches of stretch. The limit straps are ordered these days don't stretch very much, maybe like half an inch, but the ones I used to order because they were cheap, I think everyone goes through this phase where you, you try to get by with the cheap stuff, and these one layer limit straps stretch a lot. So I wouldn't recommend those. I'd recommend getting something that's like a triple layer or a double layer because they don't stretch near as much. Um, so now I can take that measurement and I can order those straps. And then in the future, um, I'll be able to just drill these holes and run some bolts that are super simple. Now I'm gonna move on to the rear. I need to locate some lower brackets for the shocks, which is gonna be a little bit tricky. So just, just bear with me, we'll see what happens. I, I don't have plans for some of these things. Sometimes you just gotta mount the axle and start taking measurements and see what you come up with. I'm starting to think this video should be called One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. I have ran into some weird snafus. This is just the reality. Just because I have a YouTube channel does not mean I'm not making the same mistakes you guys do. So I believe I ordered too long of a shock for the this application in the rear. It's got miles of down travel, which is what I wanted back here. But I, I didn't know how I was going to be mounting this shock. And I just needed to get a shock in there to figure it out. So if you look over here, you'll see the lower pedestal that I made, which I think turned out great. It's just some uh, square, or sorry, it's rectangular tube that I'd laying around. And then I welded a 3 a three eighths plate to the top of it. But we're just barely starting to strike that bump pad and we're already bottomed out on our shock. I won't know if this is, so I could just throw a shim in there, right? I won't know if that's gonna be a good remedy until I take the time and I cut all these fenders, which is gonna be some work to do them right. And then I can mount the rear tire in order to cycle it through the suspension. There's so much meat in the way here. If I mounted the rear tire now, there's no way I could cycle it. So I'm not really going to know if a shim is going to work in this instance or if I need to just order a shorter shock. So once again, sometimes you just feel like you're doing one step forward, two steps back. But I just need a little bit more time to remedy this situation. It's never fun when a project doesn't go as planned and I had more things that I wanted to include in this video, but I just don't have the material to do it. I've got a bunch of 
a bunch of excuses as to why this video can't go any farther. But the next one I think is gonna end up being gear and locker install. I know that's way too big of a uh, project to tack on to the end of this video, which is why we're gonna have to just end it with Q&A after I'm done with this little segment here. And uh, if you guys are interested in seeing a gear and locker install, make sure you comment below. I am 50-50 on doing this video. I'm not an expert at doing uh, gears. I can do it for myself, but I don't feel like I am sufficient enough at doing gears and lockers to be able to educate you guys on how to do it. It would basically be like a vlog. Like this is what it looks like when I'm doing my own gears and lockers with me only having a little bit of experience under my belt. I actually had scheduled an expert to come in and he was gonna do the gears and lockers with me and he was gonna talk about all of the little tricks of the trade that he uses, but now that can't happen. So um, if it's something you're interested in seeing, definitely comment below and let me know. And uh, if enough of you guys wanna see it, then I will film it. I'll film it and I, that'll probably be the next episode. If not, not a big deal. I can just do it myself and then the next episode you'll see will probably be like, building the rear tire carrier or something else that I have on the agenda. But now we can do questions and answers. For those of you who are new to the channel, in this series, I'm answering all of the questions from the last video because I get so many questions and DMs and emails and stuff now, I can't keep up. So I'm trying to do the best I can to answer all these questions. And right now we're gonna do that. We've got uh, Jason Becker. Do they make a full hydro system? Sort of like what comes, or what the monster truck community uses. Yes, they do. So instead of having a steering box and pitman arm and all the stuff we were messing with today, you can get a system that just has an orbital valve connected to your steering wheel and uh, a pump, and then it has a double-ended ram. And a lot of people who are hardcore off-roaders that do a lot of rock crawling and stuff like that, uh, they will get rid of the OEM steering system altogether, and they'll just put in a full hydraulic system. Matthew Hatton asks, I'm trying to improve my tow rig. Was wondering if you had any plans of doing any videos on ways to set up or improve your tow rig for towing uh, your crawler. I don't have any videos on that and I don't know if I will. Um, I do have, I will have work coming up on my tow rig, but it's not going to be anything specific to um, performance. I've already done all the performance stuff I need to do to it to make it a killer tow rig and it's, it's awesome. But I don't know, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe I will. I don't think that a video like that is going to do very well on this channel. I think that if I do tow rig content, I'm gonna have a very small amount of people that are even gonna care. So, um, I don't know. I guess the short answer is I'm not sure yet. So maybe in the future, I will get around to doing like a tow rig essentials, way to improve it and set it up kind of thing. Um, but for now, I don't have any plans in the near future. Next question is from Nick Stegel, or Stegel. Interested in how you rotate the rose joints on your uh, drop arm. Does the joint have enough movement to account for full steering lock at bump and droop? Would be interesting to see it being cycled and how it works out. Excuse me, it's so rude for me to yawn. Just exhausted, I've been working hard lately. So um, I just got it to a point today where I could move the jack stands um, safely, where I couldn't do this before, and now I can actually cycle the steering lock to lock. Um, going into this, I knew building that pitman arm was going to be an experiment no matter what. And the only way to tell if it's going to work is it's to just build the thing, you know. So um, it turns full lock one way, no problem. It's almost full lock the other way. So I don't know how much more I'm going to need. I need some time to play with it. A couple different options that I have would be to make it to where the pitman arm is no longer keyed. So you've got a whole bunch of splines all the way around the pitman arm. And then you have some like squares. And all you do to make it not keyed is, well, this is what I've done, is you take a rectangular or a uh, triangular file and where there's a square, you just slowly grind a notch over and over and over and over and over and then you turn it into a spline. So once you get rid of all the squares and it's nothing but splines, I can, un I can unbolt it and just turn it one spline the other direction and see if splitting the difference is all it needs because that could be all it needs in order to get full lock to lock. Um, that'd be the easy way. The hard way would be to have to cut and manipulate that pitman arm a little more. And it's just the cost of doing business. I'm building a fully custom build. So there's going to be some experimental parts. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Right now, I don't know if this worked completely, uh, but it's still going to be fixed. I will figure out a way to make it work. Next question is from Jake Mitchell. How confident would you be in welding lower control arm tabs to cast steel? as in the cast wedge Dana 44 Ford, doing a three link instead of factory radius arms. Uh, I wouldn't do it. In my opinion, um, if it was me and I was gonna modify one of those in order to uh, 
to fit into one of my rigs, what I would do is I'd build a big, wide, ugly bracket that goes around that wedge and uh, make it to where you can weld it on mild steel and on the cast steel. If it is cast steel, uh, I would confirm that that's cast steel too, because if it's cast iron, you're gonna have to treat it a little bit differently whenever you weld it. I just did a couple videos about this recently. So yeah, I would, I would definitely make sure that it's gonna be big, it's gonna be wide, it's gonna be ugly, it's gonna be a pain to do, but I wouldn't trust welding to that cast section right there and, and just fingers crossed, you know what I mean? I would wanna have a little bit more security before I hit the road or even hit the trail. Sean Virgilia asks, where are you in the process of adapting the ABS system to the axles? I imagine that might be a video in itself. Amazing stuff as always, keep up the great work. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I think I have it figured out. I'm 99% sure I have it figured out. The only reason it's not 100% sure is because I haven't bolted it on and tested it. So that's gonna be in, I think that'll be in the, the reassembly process video. So I'll be putting in the new axle shafts, I'll be putting on the brakes, I'll be putting on all these new parts, and uh, then I'll be bolting the axles and everything into the rig. I think in that video, that's where I'll tackle talking about the ABS system and these wheel speed sensors. I, but I am, I'm not gonna give anything up already, but I am 99% sure I have it figured out. I really do. Um, but again, until this thing is driving down the road and I can like look at the ABS light and see if it comes on, I won't know for sure. Last question is from Paul Kaiser. How did you determine your up travel? Is there a way you chose five inches? As always, great stuff. Uh, thanks, man. I'm winging it. That's how I chose. I Five inches is like the minimum that I would do. I've seen a lot of people build, especially with leaf sprung vehicles, where they only have like two or three inches of up travel and they'll have like 12 or 14 inches of down travel. I, I prefer a build that has like half and half. Um, and a lot of people disagree with that. I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do this. Um, but I, with my TJ, I have giant wheel well arches. Giant, I've cut everything perfect to where I have a lot of up travel, a lot of down travel, and it just feels really stable. Because when that wheel goes up, if it needs, if it hits to where it doesn't have any more up travel, but your obstacle continues to go up, now it's gonna pitch you, right? So at that point, it doesn't matter how much down travel you have. You need, I like having a ton of up travel to keep things flat, but I was limited. I knew that five inches is about the minimum that I was willing to deal with. And it looked like I could make that work with this build. If I want to go more than that, it's going to be a lot of work. It'll be a lot of work if I want to go more than that. Or lift the vehicle, right? If I lift the vehicle, then I can gain some up travel just because I'll be putting more of a separation between the axle and the chassis. So I guess the really long-winded answer is what I just gave you. But the short answer is that uh, I five inches was the minimum I was willing to do. And since it looked like I could make it work, that's why I chose it for this build. Thanks to everybody who leaves a comment and all the questions and everything. I appreciate the crap out of you guys. You are awesome. Um, the last four or five months have been insane for YouTubers in terms of negative comments, and I have had the worst comments I've ever had in the last four or five months. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I've, I know a lot of other YouTubers are not answering comments at all right now because it's just so brutal. But I want to continue doing this. I like this dialogue back and forth. I like having people ask questions that I might be able to help them out on. Um, so I'm gonna continue to do this until, I don't know, maybe things will get so bad that I'll stop doing this too. But for now, I'm gonna continue this dialogue that I have with you guys because I really appreciate you guys watching. Truly, honestly, I live this life because you watch. So if you enjoy the video and this is your first time with us, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you wanna help support the channel, you go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have t-shirts, hats, neck gaiters, stickers, uh, we have a Patreon link there as well if you want to help support us that way. And if you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.